Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Reed and this is Drawing Out Story. This is um, a program for the Indianapolis Public Library, the summer reading program, adult summer reading. And I'm here representing the Indiana Writers Center. Here's our website so you can check out a little bit more about what we do. Um, just a little caveat here about if we were meeting in person, what I would do is have us all go around the room, talk about our level of familiarity with graphic novels and creative writing, uh, experience and uh, what brings us all together, what makes us want to learn about that. And um, that helps me adapt the program for the audience. And lacking that, I have to kind of imagine my audience. And I'll just tell you a little bit about where I come from and we'll see how that informs it. But Basically, um, I'm a creative writer. I've been teaching creative writing for about 20 years, a little more, and um, a little bit newer to graphic novels. So I'm just gonna, we're just gonna dive in and have some fun. So um, yeah, let me just, um, first of all, just wanna make it clear that when, when you first encounter graphic novels, if you haven't, uh, it's a whole new literary skill, a uh, literacy skill. So um, you have to learn to read pictures as well as the text. And that can be jarring for some of us who aren't used to it. The words and pictures are like two symbol systems and sometimes they work with each other and sometimes they even work, work against each other. So we do have to be uh, constantly looking at each and not just counting on the artwork to illustrate the text. Um, the artwork is actually functioning as part of the text. So with that out of the way, uh, I just wanted to, I looked at my own library and just found a couple examples of books that had illustrations that wouldn't necessarily be considered graphic novels. Uh, Guy Davenport and Da Vinci's Bicycle here you just have an example of some illustrations, more illustrations, just doodles that feel like a journal. Uh, but the effect immediately is that it makes you slow down as a reader. It makes you pause, linger on the images a little bit. Um, Umberto Eco, The Mysterious Flame of Queen Loanna. This is a lot about comics um, from his childhood. And so there are, it's loaded with pictures. Um, and Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions is fun because there are many illustrations of things that any literate reader reading this book already knows what these things look, look like. So uh, we know what a light switch looks like. We know what female underpants look like. We don't need them illustrated, and yet they are. Um, and I'm sure that the Kurt Vonnegut experts could talk for a very long time about the sort of the genius behind this decision. A chicken was a flightless bird, which looked like this. And then there's this drawing. I find it amusing, um, but it begs the question, why bother to draw these images and what effect do they have? And one reason I'm asking these questions, I think it's something that if you create graphic novels or even if you're uh, just a fiction writer, not working with images, uh, these are important questions to have because they also apply to uh, when we slow down to, to illustrate, whether through description or actual images. So um, that said, I want you, I've got some exercises for us to do. And when we get to those exercises, you're just going to pause the video, hopefully, and just take out a journal. You'll be doing some free writing, maybe some drawing. Um, but before we can do any of these exercises, I want you to have a story in mind. You don't have to think too hard about what that story is, but you'll need something to work with. So if you have a story of your own that you've been working on, think about that, the structure of that, the plot. Um, or if not, just think of some common story. It can be anything at all. I just have that in your mind. And we're going to do the first sort of warm-up exercise, which is to think of your story, draw four core images from the story you have in mind, okay? So what pictures, this is what you're asking yourself with this exercise, what objects um, must be included? What do I have to show? 
in order to, to show this story well. So just, just come up with four things that are absolutely essential images. And with all of these, just hit pause, take the time to do it, and then join me again. So, um, okay, cool. So now hopefully you've done your first exercise. Now pivot a little from images to moments. So we're thinking a little bit more about actions or events. What actions should be, must be included in your graphic depiction? So what, what do we absolutely need to convey that happens in your story? Um, there's a lot that gets summarized in a story that can happen and just be told, but what are the, what are the events that need to be shown? So, okay. Hopefully you've taken the time to do that. And uh, here's my, my writing philosophy is that writing is a series of choices. So uh, whether you're writing poetry or fiction or nonfiction or graphic novels, every step of the way you are making decisions. And, and with every decision you make, you can be doing it completely intuitively or you can be doing it very, very deliberately. Um, the process of, I think, I think you get better the more intentional you can be about your choices, the more aware you are of the effects of every choice that you make. It might sound like that interrupts the creative process, but I actually think whether you're doing it in the revision stage or not, it's, it's really important to be aware of your choices. So as I was preparing this, I got to thinking a lot about scenes versus summary and, and how in the graphic novel, uh, this, this relates to how we handle time. So when I teach fiction, I always have my students think about where they can collapse time in their story and say, uh, an hour went by, a day went by, days, months, years went by, and this happened. And you can do that, you're compressing it because you can do that in a short amount of space. You can convey a large amount of time. That's the summary. Uh, scene is where, if, if you take a film metaphor, scene is where you do your slow motion, close up, blow by blow description of the action. Um, a scene is where a dialogue takes place. Dialogue takes place in a scene. Um, and time is slowed way, way down. So how does this translate into the graphic novels? So first, I, I just want to talk about these great books by Don Brown, um, Drowned City, about Hurricane Katrina and the Great American Dust Bowl. And I just want to show just a moment from uh, Drowned City. Notice here that there is not very much text at all. It's just people fight the flood, some succeed, others do not. Um, but here he's really slowing down the moment. He's showing, um, he's, he's showing a lot in these two panels. This is like a, a spread in the book. So this is a place where text can recede into the background and the pictures can do most of the work. Um, and this, this is, this page here is from a graphic novel called Feynman by Otta Vianney and Merrick. I should have a title there. Um, this is interesting because it's, Feynman, the narrator, is describing how math feels to him, how he experiences math. And that sounds very interior. And yet, uh, we can see how this is done with pictures. So if, if you look at the top left, panel just to be clear each time there's a square that's closed off that's a panel the space in between panels is called gutter they're gutters so if you look at the top left panel we have the professor drawing a cube on the board and it, he's drawing th a three-dimensional cube and he's also kind of dissolving which is peculiar and then in the next panel you have these shapes that take on even more dimensionality. They jump off the board. And uh, in the third panel, they're, they have different colors and they're swirling around him. And just notice that the, the dialogue there, well, the, the text is throwaway text. He says, huh, and okay then. 
That text is doing virtually nothing for advancing the story. This is not what's happening here. What's happening is these shapes are jumping off the board and becoming his friends. So then we, we flip, this is, the third panel is him and his youth. Then we flip to a present day narrating Feynman um, where he's describing how visuals and diagrams are key to him. Then in the second to last panel, we see these equations with multicolored symbols floating around him. And in the final panel, it's just a circus of symbols. It's um, And so here we're conveying something very interior, but doing it um, where the pictures are doing a lot of the work. Um, so now back to time. I mean, I was, yeah, this, is, this is all generally about how to handle time in a graphic novel. So these are the same authors that did Feynman. This is um, Hawking. And I wanna do a little case study where we walk through a scene where Stephen Hawking has a breakthrough. Uh, he has this realization and it occurs over the course of several panels while he's getting ready for bed. So uh, here we have, he's, he's married, he's got a baby, he's trying to help put the baby to bed. His wife says, Stephen, it's all right, go on ahead, start getting ready for bed yourself, good night, and he starts the process. And so you can see the dialogue is pretty mundane between them. It's like, I'll just catch up on the bills downstairs, call me, and he's like, I'll be fine. And then we start to see what's going on in his head. And if you're not familiar with physics, it's okay. This is, this is just depicting kind of textbook uh, visuals and, and how his mind is working in a diagrammatic kind of way. Um, but notice here how time is passing. Stephen is absorbed in thought. And we flash back from when he enters the bathroom here to start brushing his teeth. We flash over to his wife doing the bills, Jane. And then we flash back to him holding the toothbrush, thinking. And this goes on for a while. Jane starts doing the dishes. We flash back to him with the toothbrush. We flash, you know, we continue with the toothbrush. He's still thinking. And by the way, this is also meant to convey how long it takes Stephen to do ordinary activities. Because at this point, his condition is pretty advanced. Um, famous um, physicist with ALS. And at this point, his condition is pretty advanced. He's not in a wheelchair yet, but everything takes him longer. But we're showing him thinking. In the fourth panel on this page, Jane has gone from doing the dishes to reading. And when she was doing bills earlier, and all this is happening while he's brushing his teeth. So there he's thinking in the last two panels while he's brushing. She turns off the light downstairs. He's still thinking as he's wiping his mouth. And then they start kind of talking past each other. It's very not important dialogue. He's thinking, but she's like, did you say, he says, did you say something? No, nothing. And this continues, right? He's getting into bed. He's completely absorbed in thought. And that's what is being conveyed. But look how many panels it takes to convey how absorbed in thought he is. And the process, uh, really the effort involved the effort and obsession that's involved in him arriving at his realization. So by the end, he, he describes he's falling asleep. He drifts off, but he makes sure that when he wakes up, he's still got it on his mind. He stays awake as long as he could so that after sleep imposed a two hour interruption, he remembered exactly why he felt so elated before. And then the book proceeds to explain it in very textbook style panels. So just to emphasize the, the, t the role that text is playing here, here's some text. This is what the text would look like uh, if you had text only. Um, and you can see, um, especially in this second area here where he's thinking about area proportional to circumference, proportional to mass, um, that would be very tedious to read as pure dialogue. But I was able to remove the words, and it, it can help us sort of take in, again, how time is being conveyed. So he's thinking, and every, I think 
most everybody knows when they look at a comic that the the little pointy thing with the bubble means dialogue and the bubbles, the smaller bubbles mean thought. So you can see where he's thinking and where he's speaking. Um, I left some diagrams in, but mostly here you can just see and and what is being conveyed here, I think, is just the process, the time that is elapsing. OK, so I don't want to belabor the point, but now we have an exercise. So I want you to think about the four core moments from your own story, the ones that you outlined in the last exercise. And now now some interesting work comes up. I want you to think about which of those moments will take up the most panels which ones will take up the, the least amount of panels. Um, you want to try to strike a balance here. You want to be concise, as concise as possible, not tedious, right? But you also want to convey enough. You want to convey the passage of time. And I hope that in the Hawking example that we just saw, uh, that didn't feel tedious to you, especially when I took out the dialogue or the, the words, you could just see that this was the conveying of a process. So take some time to do this. I think this is a really worthwhile exercise um, to ask yourself. I think of it like an accordion, the way you're dealing with time. So there are places where you're going to expand and there are definitely places where you're going to contract. And um, so anyone should, should put some thought into that. Where do I take up the most panels? Okay. All right. Another thing I thought would be fun to talk about is the gutters. So I had this realization, and um, I've been reading a lot, but I, I'm i a poet, and I was trying to figure out why graphic novels appeal to me. And I think it's because the gutters create emotion. Those gaps between the panels, they let the reader do this emotional work. And, and I did, I, I read some of this on a blog, but that's what it resonated with me as a poet because poets like gaps. We like leaps. We like to leave space for the reader to fill in the blanks. And um, I think that this is what can happen in the gutters of um, a graphic novel. And when the reader has to do the emotional work of filling in how to get from point A to point B, how to get from one panel to the next, that reader feels more invested in the graphic novel because the reader is being forced to participate in the creation of this work. That's very different from an animated short. If you imagine uh, an animated, you know, a cartoon, you get every step when someone has a cup of coffee in their hand and they go to drink it. I mean, you get everything. Every moment is unpacked for you. Um, when there's space between moments, the reader has to imagine what's going on. And whenever the reader feels that she is participating, then she's going to feel more emotional investment. And so uh, here's one example of something strange that can happen with a gutter. Uh, this is from Persepolis by Marjane, Marjane Sartrapi. Um, I, and um, so, okay, so this is a really famous graphic novel and I butchered her name, but these are the very opening panels to Persepolis, which is a memoir about growing up during the Iranian Revolution. And uh, the first panel, she says, this is me when I was 10 years old. This was in 1980. And then look at the second panel. And this is a class photo. I'm sitting on the far left so you don't see me. Then she names from left to right her classmates. This is fascinating because in the panel on the right, you see that she's just cut off. Her arm is cut off. And she says, you don't see me. But, and I learned this from someone else, but this is so cool. If you, all you have to do is scoot these two panels, scoot these panels together, and you see it. You saw her by herself, and now you can see her as part of this. But it's a really clever move for her to make because she is immediately engaging with the reader um, as an individual and then as part of a collective. So she gets to have it both ways, which is really super cool. And this is what the first page of uh, Persepolis looks like. So, um, so back to this concept of absence or space creating emotion, 
um, what I was saying about the gutters and the reader filling it in. I have a couple examples from Victor Laval's Destroyer. This is a pretty emotional story. Well, it's it's action and adventure um, where we have a modern day Frankenstein. It's it's a woman, um, but there's this tragedy in the background, um, which is told to us in in flashbacks, in multiple brief flashbacks, just moments. So she lost her son um, to to police violence, and um, and what you see here, I, I don't have the full context, but these two panels come after um, some summary. And she says, I had tenure, a Kai attended St. Ignatius. I thought we'd made it. I assumed we were safe. And look at the next panel, but I was wrong. So the police are coming to the door and, and, letting, and telling her that her son has died. There is a tremendous amount of emotional work being done between these two panels, um, a lot. Uh, so we have to move from this comfortable, happy life of love and family to this tragedy. And then after this panel, the very next page is um, back to the sort of present day adventure story where uh, she and her robot AI Frankenstein, she's Frankenstein, but you know, her, her son are battling these forces and everything. So, so there's this huge leap or transition, which leaves the reader to do the emotional work of knowing that there's this tragedy in the background and then getting back to the story. And then here we have another flashback. Um, so he's playing baseball, he's at a game, um, he says, no, the bus stop is real close, thanks coach, or it's practice, I don't remember if it's practice or a game, but, so he says he's gonna go home, and then with the next panel, we have a phone call. It's, it's utterly unrelated activity, it's coming from a different place in time, it's a, a different place, but it's a sort of meanwhile panel. So meanwhile, there is a woman who calls the police, says, I think there's a man with a rifle walking in front of my house. Okay, what is his race? He's black and his age, 18, maybe 20, officers are on the way. And then it sort of fades out where they're kind of doing their walkie-talkie talk or whatever, police talk. And, and the next page of this is back to uh, the present day. So, this leaves the reader to do, again, a lot of filling in the gaps. The reader knows at this point that, that there is this tragedy in the past, and now we're getting the pieces and we have to piece them together. So here's a place where gutters can do, I think, poetic work of leaps, emotional leaps. All right, oh, so this is a big change. We're changing gears, pivoting here to a short story this is Italo Calvino. It's from a book called Cosmocomics, and the short story is called The Origin of the Birds, which is pretty much what it sounds like. There's a, a narrator who's describing life before birds and when birds appeared on the scene. So Cosmocomics is full of short stories of this sort of impossible narrator that witnessed all these events like the creation of the universe and you know formation of the solar system, all kinds of things. What's interesting about the origin of the birds is that the conceit is that he tells you he wishes he could be telling this as a graphic novel. He wishes this were a comic. So I've just got some excerpts here. So he says, now these stories can be told better with strip drawings, but I would have to remember better how a number of things were made, things I've long since forgotten. First, the thing I now call bird, second, what I now call I, third, the branch, fourth, the place where I was looking out, fifth, all the others. So the problem that we have in this story is a narrator who can't quite remember what things looked like in the past, but the narrator, this is great experimental fiction, the narrator, feels that the story would be best told with comic strips. 
the narrator then has no choice but to describe comic strips vaguely at times. So of these elements, these are, I'm jumping around in the story, but he says, of these elements, I remember only that they were very different from the way we would draw them now. It's best for you to try on your own. Okay, so this is part of the conceit. It's going to have to be you doing the work to imagine the series of cartoons with all the little figures of the characters in their places against an effectively outlined background, but you must try at the same time not to imagine the figures or the background either. Each figure will have its little balloon with the words it says or with the noises it makes, but there's no need for you to read everything written there letter for letter. You only need a general idea according to what I'm going to tell you. Very much uh, reader participation. It becomes a very meta work of fiction. And again, it's descriptions, but here's a pretty fun passage. To begin with, you can read a lot of exclamation marks and question marks spurting from our heads, and these mean we were looking at the bird full of amazement. In the strip that follows, now I'll erase him, he says or thinks, and to depict this desire of his, we could have him draw a diagonal line across the frame. So we are fully picturing a panel in a comic strip now with a diagonal line drawn, the bird flaps his wings, eludes the diagonal, and flies, safe, flies to safety in the opposite corner. UH, so all the characters in Cosmic Comics have unpronounceable or strange names. So UH is unhappy because with that diagonal line between them, he can't see the bird anymore. The bird pecks at the line, breaks it, and flies at old UH. Old UH, to erase him, tries to draw a couple of cross lines over him. At the point where the two lines meet, the bird lights and lays an egg. Old UH pulls the lines from under him, the egg falls, the bird darts off. There is one frame all stained with egg yolk. So I feel like I'm imagining this pretty well and there's a part of me that as a reader objects and says, you can draw this. This is very, very much pos it's possible to illustrate this. Um, but the narrator is insisting that you can't. So uh, here's a, a poignant. So the bird flew far off. In the drawing, you see a black shadow against the clouds in the sky. Not because the bird is black, but because that's the way distant birds are drawn. And I ran after him. You see me from behind as I enter a vast landscape of mountains and forests. I love the commentary on drawing here. Not because the bird is black, but because that's the way distant birds are drawn. Um, so there's this mysterious this story has mysterious qualities for me it's um a comment on drawing a comment on the impossibility of drawing it's a comment on a narrator that has difficulty remembering things it's a comment about the reader doing the work the questions that i come up with are the inverse of the questions that i had with kurt vonnegut where he illustrates underwear and a light switch so with calvino why not bother to draw the images? What effect does it have to leave these images out? And I, I don't have your answers. These are rhetorical questions. I think it's fascinating. And I hope that some of you take up a challenge of trying to answer this question with your own work, because uh, I think it's kind of fun. So my exercise for you now is to write about your impossible panels. Think about what in your story can't be drawn. Imagine there's something that can't quite be drawn, but you wish it could be drawn. So try describing it anyway. I hope you take some time with this one. I think this is a strange but potentially fun exercise. And I would just like to add that if we were in person, we would all be reading the results of our exercises, or at least we'd have volunteers and it would be super fun. So um, maybe you can share with a friend. Okay, so just um, what did I learn? I learned a lot of about comics from Scott McCloud. He has a couple books, Understanding Comics and Making Comics. And interestingly, uh, I got more out of Making Comics, which is aimed at potential graphic novelist than understanding comics. Making comics to just put everything in terms that made a lot of sense to me as a maker. So 
McLeod uh, breaks down the choices he sees writing as a series of choices, as I do. So he says that for graphic novelists, we have several choices. Choice of moment, choice of frame, choice of image, choice of word, and choice of flow. So just a little bit about each of these. And again, this is not to make everything super academic, but it is hopefully to make you a little more aware of the power that you have as a maker. What kinds of choices are you making um, at every instance when you, when you create? So choice of moment. This is where you decide which moments to include in the story and which to leave out. Okay, um, this is the most basic decision any writer has to make, and yet it's a challenging one. Um, most writers, I think, tend to put in more moments than they need. It's just, it, I don't know, I don't know why that is, but most most writers have to cut. They write extra, and they have to they have to make the tough decision of what elements to leave in and what to cut. So. His guideline, McLeod's guideline, is each panel should further the plot. Having said that, think back to the Hawking one where he's coming up with his epiphany at bedtime, brushing his teeth and going to bed. Each panel is furthering his mental state. But you just have to be able to make the argument for each thing. So each panel should further the plot. Remove one and the meaning is altered. Move one around and the meaning also changes. This is a good guideline. The next choice is frame. So this is choosing the right distance and angle to view the moments and where to trim them. I found this fascinating when I had my own students make uh, graphic novels and I told them art, artistic ability was not a criteria. So it, it doesn't matter if you draw stick figures. What's fascinating is even if you choose to draw stick figures, you still have to decide how close up Am I going to put the camera and am I going to do a view from above or a view from the side or head on? You decide how closely to frame an action to show details or how far to pull back. And amazingly, all of these choices have emotional effects. So how you crop the panel, how you balance it and how you tilt it, which I think is really cool. This is where I'm geeking out. Okay, choice of image. Rendering the characters, objects, and environments in the frames clearly. Style of drawing, mood. I think this is the most straightforward one, so that I probably don't have much to say on that one. Choice of word. Okay, picking words that add valuable information and work well with the images around them. Here's where I would just say, since words and symbols, words and pictures are working in conjunction you don't want to make it redundant. So you don't want to have words that simply describe what you're already showing. And you don't want to have images that just illustrate what you're talking about. So have them help each other. Or if you're having fun, you can have them push against each other and create some kind of tension in the reader's mind. But also words allow for specificity. Um, you know, there are certain images that could be open to multiple interpretation. And comics count on words to anchor the story and direct the reader's attention uh, and focus. So finally, choice of flow. This is guiding readers through and between panels on a page or screen. And while we all read uh, here in America, um, we read left to right and we read top to bottom, you can still sort of control where your reader's eyes are going to go. So McLeod tells us there's no way to force readers to take a specific path, but you can reliably predict where their attention will go. Um, this is all my paraphrase, but this is these are McLeod's points. So, so uh, just to walk through choice a little bit. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but um, here's the text. He gives us a very simple text to work with. Bob was a happy baby. At 18, he went to war. At 36, he bought a house. He died at 72. Okay. So he says you could illustrate in a very straightforward way. And here you see the images that are accompanying the text. Uh, happy baby, went to war, house, died. Very um, predictable images for these moments in a life. But he says you could also draw the whole thing just using hands. So here's another possibility. 
uh, holding a rattle, holding a grenade, holding a key, and then folded hands. Um, and one thing that my students point out is that the difference here just between the first and second versions, this version here is a very much, you know, a third person kind of distant perspective. The version with the hands feels more personal. It feels intimate. Um, he says you could also have a narrator speak these words to a reader. I think the risks of that are pretty obvious. Uh, if you're just looking at a narrator the whole time, you're not going to get a lot of variety in what you see. So you really do have to have, even in these four panels, he's got his narrator uh, making different facial expressions, moving his head around. Um, but I think it's a challenge if you're going to use a narrator. Um, well, actually, in Feynman, you do have him narrating, but there's so much flashback that it kind of interrupts it and makes it for, makes for more variety there. Oh, and then he says you could try symbols. So uh, there you have symbols for happy baby war, house, death. Okay, uh, this is back to Don Brown that I mentioned a little bit earlier. I just want to say a couple things about, or I guess just point readers in this direction if you haven't explored Don Brown before. I, I love how he uses color. This is from uh, the Great American Dust Bowl. So this one, there's a lot of browns, grays, um, beiges, and blacks. And these colors are working together to create like a palette, a very consistent palette. So um, here you have a Dust Bowl. This is, these are both uh, depictions of a storm beginning. Um, and then this is from Drowned City, so very different color palette. Uh, we have blues and some greens and lavenders and uh, gray here. Right? Well, I see it, yeah. Um, another, another graphic novelist I recommend is Lauren Redness. She has a very collage style, but like Don Brown, she uses a lot of color, uh, uniformity with her color palettes. So Thunder and Lightning is about weather, but um, it's about climate too and climate change. So the, um, and I just picked some illustrations that are wordless or very few words just to give you a sense of the kind of stuff in there. But she'll have a, t a page, Redness will have a page that's really super dense with text. She'll use photographs as well as drawings. Uh, so sh she uses... Uh, other primary materials like maps and uh, documents, so she mixes it all together. So here's a yeah, here's a a page about the desert, um, and she's really pulling from a wide variety of sources with her research. So that's just another one that I'd recommend. And this is still from Thunder and Lightning, um, but she also wrote Radioactive, Marie and Pierre Curie, and you can see. A different color palette from Thunder and Lightning, and uh, these are just a couple pages from that. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I'll make this this point about clarity and intensity, which I thought was a useful point that McLeod makes, and uh, this is just balance. Sometimes, um, if you increase intensity, it's at the expense of clarity. So he gives these examples here. On the left, you see um, a basic, clear series of events. On the right, you see the same events, but with increased intensity. And so just take some time and look sort of panel by panel. If you look at the top panels, compare them, you have some dialogue kind of popping out of the panel. You know, on the, on the second panel, you get an extreme close-up of the person yelling. Third panel, you have something popping out. These are, you know, um, bursting out of the frame. So you can see everything. Look at the bang panel on the left. It's a lot more straight, straightforward. But here on the right, the version, you know, he's coming out and the bang is even bigger and it's the camera angles tilted, that sort of thing's going on. Um, but then he gives an example of taking that just too far, where if you increase the intensity so much, which I understand would be super tempting, 
um, to just, it, for me, it was super tempting to have extreme angles and close-ups and, and stuff popping out of the panels, a little bit like the Calvino short story where, you know, there's a diagonal line drawn and the bird pecks at it and all of that. But um, the point is that if you increase intensity too much, it is at the expense of clarity. It sacrifices some of the clarity. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, this, this woman, Shveta Miller, um, I found her blog. She teaches her students about graphic novels. She has them do graphic novels. I, I liked the set of questions that she has in italics. So can I explain how I chose to create this panel? Have I considered the impact on the story if I were to change the panel to panel sequence, the words or pictures? Do my panels allow for reader participation, committing closure, she calls it? Am I finding this challenging? What do I need to know how to do? What or who can help me? I think that's a very helpful list of questions if you're embarking on this on your own. Um, so for close, closing remarks, um, these are famous books, Will Eisner, Graphic Storytelling and Visual Narrative and Comics and Sequential Art. And Eisner was sort of the precursor to Scott McCloud, which I've been pulling from. So those are my recommendations. I hope that this has given you a good start and I wish you the best of luck in your drawing out story adventures. Thanks so much.